So I'd like to thank Dr. Lee and Dr. Zhang for asking me to come and talk. It's an opportunity to give you a historical perspective where we've been in radiation therapy and, and where we're going. Um, this is a fairly general talk so that hopefully I can give you some background in, in what radiation therapy is all about. And uh, to show where we're going, I try to sum up everything you need to know about radiation in one slide because it's actually all about radiobiology, even though we always like to focus on the techniques. It's more about understanding what we're trying to accomplish when we uh, approach somebody with radiation therapy. Over here you have a, a tumor, and this one is a fairly well defined and a bunch of normal tissue that you're going to give fractionated therapy to. And either because you can't identify the target very well or maybe it's more diffuse, you give fractionated therapy, a little bit of radiation, and that's a terrible term to use a little bit, but it gets the idea of fractionation across. You're going to take images once every five days so that you actually know where the patient is. Um, you could do it more frequently if you were going to use a more conformal uh, approach, but in the end you end up with a significant number of the tumor cells killed, um, and because you fractionated it, most of the normal tissue is going to survive, but you are going to have a few normal tissue cells that are going to die. On the other end of that spectrum is a relatively new technique called stereotactic radiosurgery, and this is a, a very different approach. This is an ablative dose of radiation. It's very, very focused. Everything you treat is going to get exposed to radiation, so you're going to kill both tumor cells and normal tissue if it's in the target volume. And the bigger difference is, is that by having this huge cell kill very rapidly, you're likely going to have more swelling, more edema as the body tries to process these dead tumor cells until it calms back down. There's also this entity that's somewhere in between called stereotactic hypofractionated radiotherapy, or that's more equivalent to stereotactic body radiotherapy. The idea being that is if you give multiple fractions of a larger dose per day, you're going to get some of the benefit of fractionation, but if you do it very, very precisely, you're going to be able to mini minimize the amount of normal tissue that gets injured. Now that, that's the theory. Um, there's actually quite a bit of disagreement as to whether that actually is true, whether delivering two to five fractions really gets you that fractionation benefit that we see with a full five to six week course of radiation, or whether it's because when we use multiple fractions, hypofractionated, um, you get less edema, so you get less side effects. Um, Dennis Shreve, uh, a radiation oncologist at Utah, has a paper out on multi-session uh, or multi-stereotactic radiosurgery for meningiomas versus fractionated therapy and the two to five fractions. And he proposes uh, that you need about 25 fractions before you actually get this normal tissue sparing it with fractionation. The other thing is, is why five fractions? You'll notice that there's papers that come out from Europe where they'll do 10 fractions of stereotactic treatment. Unfortunately, in the United States, that has a lot to do with billing. As soon as you go over five fractions, it can't be stereotactic. So there's uh, a radio financial uh, mechanism in, invoked here. Last thing is, we know that when we treat with fractionated therapy, we cause some changes in all of those cells, and they're going to remember that down the road. And that's going to become important when we talk about where we're, where we're evolving to and how we think about retreatment. Um, external beam initially started out somewhat nihilistic. We took patients with metastatic disease. Uh, there wasn't a lot of hope that we were going to be able to do a lot for them. We were just trying to help give them some pain relief. It had to be easy to set up. It had to be quick to set up. And it tended to be more reactive. In other words, somebody had a problem, they had pain, we just wanted to help them out. We're evolving, and some of this comes from our approach with cranial stereotactic, to be uh, more aggressive, saying we can do more for these patients, we can use uh, dose escalation, we can be more proactive instead of waiting until they have symptoms, maybe we need to treat uh, and trying to prevent problems. Uh, we, we feel like we probably can do better help, uh, but this becomes a lot more complicated in the delivery. I'm not going to talk a lot about non-metastatic disease. There are, as Dr. Zhang pointed out, there are indications for radiation. Um, we're learning in terms of what normal tissue can tolerate, and the big difference is evolving is that with uh, more refined forms of radiotherapy, we're able to do dose escalation. As we heard earlier, 
The incidence of metastatic disease happens in 5 to 70 percent. Obviously, I found a few different references than Dr. Lee, but anyway, it's quite common in uh, people with, with cancer. Spinal, common is, spinal column is the most common osseous site, maybe up to 40 percent. Pain is the biggest issue. If you look at a lot of the quality of life literature, most of the fears that cancer patients have is dying in pain, and they will do anything they can to avoid pain. Obviously, uh, neurological compromise from malignant spinal cord compression is also the other issue. You're all quite familiar with the different types of lesions. This is a sclerotic lesion. This is actually somebody who got chemotherapy. This presents a challenge. Is this a, a tumor that's converted and growing and becoming sclerotic as opposed to previously being lytic? And does this represent response to chemo or is this a new problem area? From a radiation oncology perspective, we're always interested in not only in one lesion that's causing a particular problem, but what else is around. Um, because as we start to use radiation, we have to think where else might we need to treat again? What normal tissue are we going to use up? We also have to worry about tumors that have significant perispinal or epidural component spreading along the chest wall, how that's going to impact our treatment planning. And lastly, when there's a mechanical problem, uh, this is not our, our area that we're going to help out a lot. We can treat this, it'll respond, but it's not likely going to provide the patient with much pain relief because of the mechanical instability. The other thing is, is that uh, I just wanted to reinforce this idea that as a radiation oncologist, we're always interested in what else is going on elsewhere in the spine. This is an individual that had almost complete destruction of a vertebral body and then has another one that is uh, potentially on their way. And when it comes to radiation fields and designing treatments, we always have to think, once again, what's going to be the next step? If you're going to treat metastatic disease, better plan on doing it on a Friday. This is actually a study from, uh, from England. They looked at the number of referrals for malignant spinal cord compression, and it is statistically significant to be on Friday. So we always plan on Friday that we're going to hear from somebody with, a, with an issue. I want to also reinforce this idea of a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, cancer patients are very complicated. They have lots of issues going on. It's not just one area. Uh, communication is important. This idea of survivability, the response um, becomes very important in terms of what treatment options we're going to offer. We're going to offer somebody something very different if they're newly diagnosed. They haven't seen a lot of chemotherapy. Everybody's pretty optimistic that we're going to get some sort of a response versus somebody with known disease who's on their fifth line agent. They've been on four experimental protocols. Um, the options that we may be able to offer are going to be significantly different. Oftentimes there's competing issues. Uh, pain may be the big one that, that brought them to our attention, uh, but we also have to worry about if their airway is going to get blocked off by that lung mass or they're going to lose neurological function from their brain met. So understanding the entire clinical picture becomes very important and it, it needs uh, involvement from everybody, medical oncology, the surgeons, radiation oncology, primary care, pain, and potentially even palliative care. At some point, somebody, usually it's one of the oncologists, it may be one of you guys, maybe you know the patients much better than we do, you have to talk about the potential survivability and treatability. Because what we offer, how uh, aggressive we're going to be, really depends on how well we can predict how well somebody's going to survive. Problem with that is we do a terrible job. Um, we tend to overestimate. If you look at all the studies on brain mets, spine mets, ask somebody how long you think this patient is going to survive, we're generally overly optimistic. Um, but we need to use that as some starting point <clears throat> before we offer therapy. From the radiation oncology perspective, obviously we want to know the symptom and how it's related to what we see on imaging. If there's mechanical issues, we're going to be talking with all of you a lot more. One of the things you're looking from us is how responsive we think the disease is to radiation. Is this something like uh, multiple myeloma or lymphoma that can respond potentially within 24, 48 hours? Or is this something like renal cell or melanoma where maybe the response rate is 50-50 at best? What else is going on systemically? What other issues do we have to, to worry about? Um, is there adequate imaging? Uh, well, you guys generally want to focus on the, the issue at hand. Uh, once again, I'm always going to be worried about what else is going on in the spine. It looks bad as a radiation oncologist to be treating one level of the vertebral body and then as they finish their radiation therapy, 
they have a uh, new pain and uh, new neurological symptoms from the bigger lesion that was just out of the imaging field. History of prior radiation. To most people that means, yeah, they got 300 times 10 or they got breast tangents. From a radiation oncology perspective, that means imaging. We want to know actually where those beams came in, what doses to what critical structures were delivered. We're going to be able to give you a lot better information or input about in terms of what we can do by actually knowing those details. There's also certain patient factors that are going to be important. There are some relative contraindications. Uh, connective tissue disorders like scleroderma is one that you know, sometimes we get a little bit more concerned about potential radiation complications. Uh, once again, it often depends on the clinical scenario that we're dealing with, whether this is really the only option for the patient. Some of our challenges, they're not, they're not huge. Uh, we see the patients, make a plan, talk with everybody else. Then we have to do a simulation. Pretty much everybody is doing CT sims, something to keep in mind. We have the opportunity to get more imaging if you're interested. Um, it's not going to be standard uh, anatomical imaging. We're going to put patients in potentially unusual positions. If we're going to treat a thoracic spine lesion, you know, we're going to have their arms up above their head um, <clears throat> to get their arms out of the radiation field. But it is an opportunity to get more imaging. We're going to make a, an immobilization device. Uh, to try to hold the patient still in a, approximately the same position. However, many of our metastatic patients, their pain is severe enough that they really can't tolerate a lot of uh, uh, immobilization. Sometimes it's a, uh, it's a foam pad that they're on. That's all they can tolerate. Once we're done with simulation, we'll do planning. That's where we do the dose calculations. That has to be verified by a physicist as well as verified by port film so that we know that we're treating exactly what we intended to treat and then ultimately the delivery. We've gotten significantly more advanced with how we do treatment planning. Um, this is an example of a, a fairly straightforward APPA field to treat uh, somebody who had a resection of a MET. We come in from the front and the back so that we can smooth out that dose a little bit and reduce the hot spot posteriorly. These curves here represent the different isodose or dose clouds that are delivered. And it also gives us a, a way to calculate how much exposure is to the remaining normal tissue. That creates a, a, what we call a DRR, or port film, so that we can verify where we're targeting to. We use different anatomy to make sure we're in the right location. However, uh, oftentimes it's quite a challenge. So on the left is our DRR. This is the field we intended to de deliver. And this is a port film taken by a linear accelerator. Um, most of you would agree that that's a pretty poor quality film. That's where we've been for many decades. Um, so making sure that we're in the correct location has often been a somewhat of a challenge, and that's why we've ended up with larger and larger fields. Uh, <coughs> this is a different patient than the one I from the previous slide. You can see that this field is quite a bit wider. Uh, that was one of the challenges in this individual, is they were in enough pain that even during the treatment, as we're watching them on a, on a camera remotely, um, they're moving around. And once again, that, that's not ideal radiation therapy. It works. Majority patients get some relief, about 60%. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Most will get avoid neurological deficits. We'll get a response. Um, fractionation schedule doesn't really matter, but as radiation oncologists, we love to study it. There are over 20 randomized trials that have looked at different fractionation schemes. You will find everybody has an opinion. Um, they will argue one way or the other that there's no way they're doing 800 times one. You have to retreat too many patients. Uh, it's too toxic to normal tissue. To you know, somebody will say 250 times 15, you get a better response. It's more uh, durable. The advantage is it can be done almost anywhere. These are uh, two fairly good papers, and there's a, a nice review, kind of a summary of these two papers by Wu and C. Uh, <clears throat> these are a meta-analysis of all the multiple randomized trials that have looked at different fractionation schemes. That 60% that I had on the previous slide, that's kind of the, the summary response. You can see that in general, when we use single fraction, A gray times 1, there's going to be a higher rate of retreatment, 21 versus 7.4. <clears throat> that's combining all these thousands of patients that have been on these trials. The fracture rate, there was no difference in one meta-analysis. The other one, the fracture rate was slightly higher and statistically significant in the uh, single fraction arm. 
In terms of risk of cord compression, in bone mets that were treated, there was no difference whether we did 800 times 1 or 300 times 10 in all these different studies. The bone will heal after radiation, especially with palliative doses. It just takes a while. Somewhere between 65 and 85 percent of lytic lesions will eventually become undergo ossification. It's going to take anywhere from three to six months. Um, <clears throat> as we go to higher and higher doses, I think this becomes a, a more interesting question. We know that when there's neurological symptoms involved, that we're going to be a lot more dependent on surgery. This is the Patchell study that everybody is probably quite familiar with, showing that patients that underwent surgical resection followed by radiation did much better than those that underwent radiation alone in terms of ambulation, in terms of regaining the ability to walk, in terms of better Frankel and ACE scores, as well as requiring less pain medication and steroids. So what are the problems with fractionated therapy? It's not very sophisticated. It's generally non-ablative doses. Doesn't matter which one you pick. Maybe 250 times 15 is a little bit better than 800 times 1. But it's still not what we would consider a, a, a truly therapeutic dose of radiation. We also know that fractionated therapy could interrupt chemotherapy. There are certain chemo agents, taxanes, potentially some of the, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors that are coming on board that we don't want to do concurrently with radiation due to increase in normal tissue toxicity. We know that once we've done it, we've used up some of the normal tissue tolerance. If it doesn't work, so we've used up some of our, our ability to get more radiation in there. We also know that bigger fields lead to more side effects. So uh, this isn't fair to ask surgeons because uh, it's a non-surgical, I, I set this up as a non-surgical question, but uh, if you had a 49-year-old metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, has already been on two chemotherapies with modest response, um, was doing okay until Friday, they call you with severe right SI pain and uh, <clears throat> have these multiple lesions at uh, L5 and L3. Plan is for further chemotherapy with a taxane. They're still continuing to work even though they say their pain is 8 to 9 out of 10. They're not on any medications. Uh, what would you offer? And, uh, I was planning on being able to survey everybody, but I think any of these are reasonable. Once again, if you had a, a group huddle and talked about the different options, the Medical oncologist might argue, well, I think we can do okay. This is, you know, first time they've had a pain crisis. We can manage this with pain medications, narcotics, and I think the taxane still, even though it's the third line agent, they have a, a reasonably good chance of getting a response. I might argue, well, you know, we're, we're quite effective. We could do 800 times one. You could still get on with the, uh, the taxane. That would work out fairly well. The other option is to just use the pain medications alone. Generally, as somebody who's working is still going to be pretty aggressive in how they approach their cancer. We also have to decide how much to treat. This also comes down to the projected disease trajectory of the uh, patient. Whether we're limited, we treat kind of one area of the spine. Can we get away with treating one area or, you know, the, the standard one vertebral body plus or minus one? Or is that going to get us into a problem down the road because they have another lesion that's just two vertebral bodies up, maybe we should treat that one at the same time as well. So these are some of the, the things that we go through when we decide how, how far, how much to treat. Well, we've evolved. We want to know what we can do beyond just standard external beam radiation. Once again, since I'm the hammer and the nail is radiation, we can give more radiation. Why can we do this now? Because when I started my training, we used to say, yep, 300 times 10, that's all we do, one time. You don't get it again. Um, we never thought about coming back and re-irradiating. And part of that is, a lot of it is due to understanding radiobiology a lot better. My little uh, ridiculous cartoon that we started with, <clears throat> we know that the normal tissue around where we irradiated remembers that treatment. And if we brought more radiation right away, we'd probably end up with a lot of destruction. However, we have shown now that over time, potentially as early as six months, potentially as long as two to three to five years, that you get some normal tissue repair. Could be up to 50% in six months that you can actually come back and re-irradiate those areas and make it just as safe or reasonably safe for patients who have recurrent tumors. Generally, we're going to want to use much smaller radiation fields. We're going to try to be more precise. 
but we're understanding more and more about how, how well uh, normal tissue can tolerate radiation, how it can repair itself, and how we can come back and re-irradiate. This is uh, one of the areas that often gets neglected, is the impact that physics and imaging has had on our field and our ability to come back and re-irradiate. When we first started, we did 2D dose calculations. Basically, you could calculate the dose along a line, um, not very sophisticated. Uh, the actual delivery, even though we could measure it without a patient to about 1 to 2 percent, the actual delivery varied anywhere between 10 to 20, even 25 percent. And so a lot of those initial normal tissue tolerances were based on uh, inability to be more exact in terms of the delivery. <clears throat> when we went to uh, 3D planning, CT based, we were able to do much more sophisticated dose calculations. We could actually look in 3D all different planes, where the dose is at, how much is being delivered, and our ability to actually deliver it that much better, we're now down to about 5%, and we could, the algorithms that we used to calculate the dose were much more sophisticated as well. Ultimately, we've now gotten some very, very sophisticated forms of very focused radiation where we can be very accurate with the dose calculation and be very confident and how much dose is actually delivered to a, a relatively small volume or be able to determine that dose to that small volume. If any of you re read the Wall Street Journal, um, <coughs> radiation oncology did not look very good about a year ago. There was a seven part series on how this highly technical advanced delivery had caused severe injury in a number of patients and that was due to the fact that they were not doing appropriate quality assurance in the actual delivery of the radiation. They weren't getting that 1 to 2 percent accuracy in, in what their machines were actually delivering. So if you want to avoid being in the Wall Street Journal, make sure your medical physicist is very, very good. And uh, if you're involved in body stereotactic, that's what we're talking about when we talk about very precise uh, monitoring of what you're actually delivering. We've also been able to borrow extensively from cranial stereotactic radiosurgery and it, it had an advantage in getting a jump start because uh, with the skull our brains are nice and rigid. It's very easy to put a frame on and hold somebody absolutely still. And so we've got a lot of experience using radiosurgery to treat lesions very, very precisely. This is somebody undergoing gamma knife. They get a rigid frame placed. They get an MRI. We can target this lesion to within less than the thickness of a hair about 0.5 to 0.7 millimeters, and the machine itself is accurate in its delivery to about 0.2 to 0.3 millimeters. So we are really truly limited now in cranial radiosurgery by the imaging that we can obtain. And part of the excitement for applying this elsewhere in the body is we all have a series of patients like this one. The pretreatment scan is on the left, the new one is on the right, and you can see within a month dramatic responses using ablative radiotherapy. The other advantage is that we were able to treat multiple areas all at the same time, all in the same run. I think ultimately this patient had about 15 lesions that we treated. Um, you know, we, we started out saying, oh, you can only treat one, and then it was one to three, and now there's a lot of centers, us included, showing that, you know, you can treat five and six and seven and eight, nine and ten, and the patients can do quite well. But that's where the analogy so somewhat stops when we get to spinal stereotactic, is that <clears throat> they are quite different as well. Um, well, you can use image guidance to do cranial stereotactic. You are completely dependent to use image guidance to do spinal stereotactic. We also know that in the brain, you have parallel components. Obviously, there's critical structures throughout. In the spine, since it's serial, if we knock out one area, that is going to impact everything downstream. That becomes much more important in terms of what small volumes of the spinal cord can tolerate. We also have the difficulty of all the degrees of freedom with the spine. What we think is immobilized is still not quite the same as intracranial stereotactic. Couple terms, uh, stereotactic body radiotherapy generally means two to five fractions. Stereotactic body radiosurgery, is by most people's definition one fraction. So surgery gets a, a, 
the designation for one fraction, stereotactic radiotherapy for two to five. To kind of combine both of that, Timmerman has proposed this term SABER, which is stereotactic ablative radiotherapy. There are multiple different devices to do this, and we can have a debate all day about which one's better. Uh, there's pluses and minuses to all of them. We use a, a Linac based, specifically Synergy S. Uh, there's a CyberKnife, which is a robotic arm that is able to, it has a linear accelerator on the end of the robotic arm. It takes multiple images as it treats from different nodes to deliver a high uh, precise radiation beam. Novalis and then tomotherapy. The steps to treatment are fairly similar. Once again, an evaluation and then a simulation that's going to be CT based. The big difference here is the immobilization. We're going to spend a lot more time. We're going to use a full body bag with a vacuum on top to completely immobilize the patient. And we're going to have a, a fiducial marking system as well so that we can localize the target even better. The planning takes a lot longer. It's not a simple, you know, you can put together APPA fields in about 30 minutes and get somebody treated. For body stereotactic, between the dosimetrist input, the physics input, it's probably going to take anywhere between two and three, maybe even four days. Sometimes a little faster, depending on what else your caseload is. <clears throat> it's going to take a lot more effort from medical physics to do the, the quality assurance. Um, all plans need to be verified. The actual delivery is different because we're going to do a much better job at localizing the patient. In addition to the fiducials that we use to set the patient up so that we know we're starting very close to the right spot, we'll get a cone beam CT. So what this is is that treatment planning CT and then we get a, on the machine itself, we can create a fairly reasonably good quality cone beam CT. Those two are overlaid on top of each other to make sure that the patient is in exactly the same position as we had initially intended uh, at the time of planning. During treatment, we'll get one pre-treatment, halfway through treatment, and then at the end of treatment to verify that the patient has not moved during the course of this stereotactic uh, procedure. We're still working on the different fractionation schemes. People started fairly conservatively, even doing them as a boost after external beam radiation using 10 to 12 gray in one fraction that has gradually increased. Um, there's actually a, currently an RTOG trial specifically looking at whether or not stereotactic body radiotherapy is more effective than traditional external beam radiotherapy. So they're going to compare 16 gray in one fraction delivered stereotactically versus 8 gray in one fraction with traditional uh, radiation fields, which would be the one vertebral body above and below. You can see that the dosimetry is a lot more sophisticated. Those isodose curves that we looked at have a lot closer dose drop off. So the closer these lines are together, the faster your dose drops off. The downside is with all these body stereotactic delivery systems is that you do get these fingers from the different beams that come in. And it's going to be anywhere between 12 to maybe even 20 different <coughs> orientations that you're going to get these low dose regions. So it's not quite as sophisticated as what we have in the brain. Um, part of that is, is that you just, you have to get the radiation in there somewhere. You're still going to get these low dose fingers. It's still a very low dose, but it's something that um, we are concerned about because it does have an impact in terms of retreatment or treating lesions that are adjacent to a previously treated area. Candidates for body stare tactic. This is a great review article that kind of summarizes all the current literature of who makes a good candidate. They have less than three sites. They have a good performance with minimally active disease elsewhere. If they don't want surgery or they have residual after surgery, they may be a good candidate for body stereotactic. You have to have three to five millimeters between the, the tumor and the spinal cord. That number is going to be very dependent on your institution and how comfortable you are with your setup, your delivery, your team. Um, most people, when they first start, they're going to be fairly cautious and probably start closer to five and then gradually work their way down to three. There has to be a, a very compliant patient. They need to be able to lie on their back for about an hour. Some of these systems are getting a little bit faster, but it's still quite a bit of time on the table in one position trying not to move. Contraindications were times when we cannot use it. If they recently failed external beam radiation therapy, that chance for at least some normal tissue tolerance 
hasn't had a chance to happen. So generally, it's not suggested you proceed with stereotactic within three months after uh, external beam radiation therapy. If there's any sort of mechanical instability or progressive neurological symptoms, those are not good candidates for stereotactic body radiotherapy. Once again, patient factors. Um, if you have somebody who has a, a lung lesion as well and they're very short of breath and they're going to be kind of gasping for air on the treatment table, this is not going to work. Um, they have to be comfortable enough to be able to lie still. Generally, the cutoff is tumors less than five centimeters. That's uh, obviously something that will probably be pushed as we get more experience with body stereotactic. Kind of a summary of the responses. You can see that, um, once again, looking at all those meta-analysis where some are around 60 percent, the response rates for body stereotactic <clears throat> in terms of pain relief have been reported to be anywhere between 70 and 100 percent, and it's been used in a variety of settings, either up front, somebody who newly diagnosed, they have a solitary bone lesion, or recurrent after external beam, or even in augmentation to surgery, even after vertebroplasty, kyphoplasty, corpectomy and laminectomy, there's all these have been looked at in a retrospective manner. It also appears to be very well tolerated with relatively minimal complication rates. What are the challenges with body stereotactic radiotherapy? One is, what's the target? And this is one where I'd really like the audience response system. I don't know how many of you would pick D. It's not unreasonable, but I can tell you, you better really trust your physicist. Because if you have a target that wraps around the cord, it's really hard to create isodose curves that have a hole. So that's going to be a very difficult delivery. These other three are relatively straightforward. You can have very precise, very nice dose drop off and really spare the cord in this case. There is some debate whether or not you should put a margin, two to three millimeters around your target, avoiding the, that margin when it comes close to the cord to avoid normal tissue complications. One of the challenges is how small. Well, first of all, you probably this isn't causing significant pain. But there is some limit in our ability to actually do the dose calculation at very small tumor sites. In the brain, when Gamma and I first came out with its four millimeter collimator, the relative output factor changed several times because of improving technology, improving understanding, and, and how that dose was actually delivered to that small of an area. Right now, our physicists feel fairly comfortable treating a lesion that's at least two centimeters. So that's quite a bit of difference. They feel like once we get below two centimeters, in terms of our equipment that we're using right now and our, our ability to do the dose calculation, they're a lot less confident. So that right now is somewhat of our, our limitation as, we're, uh, as we've uh, implemented body stereotactic. Hopefully you'll keep in mind as we go through the rest of this day, um, where's the target? This is a young individual who unfortunately has had a multiply recurrent chordoma, multiple surgeries, instrumentation, um, recent surgery two months ago, it's already grown back. You've got involvement in both psoas muscles. Um, you've got a cage in here and we were contemplating using body stereotactic, but the question is where is tumor in here relative to the hardware? You could do a CT myelogram, you can do anything to try to improve upon that but we're really imaging dependent. And so anything you use that may impact what we can use to identify target is gonna, is gonna limit what our ability to actually be able to deliver that radiation dose. My uh, chair would not allow me to stand up here and not mention this. What about protons? So we have broken ground for a proton center. It will be online March 2013. And one of the excitements about protons is that you can take some of the technology, even though not all of it is there, in terms of patient alignment and apply it to uh, proton radiotherapy, which has the advantage of no exit radiation. And uh, <clears throat> since I didn't want to interfere with copyright laws, I had got this from the Procure site. They're, they allow us to use these to give explanations. But this is a lung cancer that's being treated with protons. You have an entrance beam coming in from the right. You have no exit dose you still have entrance dose. Now, the advantage is that you can have very rapid dose drop-off on the back side of that, so you can get that very 
precise limitation to the dose that's going to be spread to normal tissue. This has some potential advantages in the spine because most spine uh, proton treatments, you can have a single beam coming in from the back and one from the side and be able to really shape that right around the spinal cord by kind of blocking or limiting the, the dose that's delivered during that, in that area around the spinal cord. It'll also significantly reduce the amount of exit radiation, there is none, in terms of what happens in front of the spinal cord or vertebral bodies. So this is something that's going to be quite exciting to see how this once again improves or evolves our ability to deliver more sophisticated radiation therapy. So we, we've evolved, we've become much more sophisticated. We understand better, but we still have a ways to go. The clinical radiobiology, you'll read a lot of papers about alpha beta ratio, um, normal tissue tolerance. I would just remind you that unfortunately my field started with erythema dose, which means you treat it until the skin turned red and they couldn't tolerate it. Um, and all that modeling, well, it's helpful and it gives us some guidelines. At the end of the day, radiobiology is, is a clinical outcome. We need to understand what people can tolerate. We've improved, evolved over time because of our ability to do better dose calculations. Um, <clears throat> we can be much more sophisticated and accurate in what is actually deliverable. All three of these are linked together to imaging. The better imaging we have, the more likely we are to, to be able to know exactly where that dose went. In terms of spine metastases, everybody's input is important in terms of when we come up with a plan. We need to know what other options are available from a systemic point of view, from a surgical point of view, what other sites of disease are we going to have to, to deal with. Standard fractionated radiotherapy works. It just doesn't work on everyone. Um, it's relatively easy. Big fields we know cause more side effects. And I would like to point out that there's a fairly significant cost differential. It's about a sixth of the cost to do standard fractionated therapy versus body stereotactic radiosurgery or radiotherapy. It is definitely something that's doable. Technically, it's now fairly routine and easy. Um, we do think that we're likely going to get a better response with ablative doses, but it also brings up a lot of questions. Should it only be used for salvage because it's so expensive? Should somebody have to fail external beam first? We have this ongoing debate it's quite a heated debate in brain metastases. Does everybody have to get whole brain radiation so that we take care of all the known disease as well as the unknown disease before they get radiosurgery? There's many centers. Uh, my, I, I fit in this latter category where I'd say, no, let's just do radiosurgery. We can come back and treat again. Um, that may eventually evolve in spine as well in somebody who's a good performance status patient. You got two or three lesions before they have a lot of symptoms, you treat them. Six months later, they have a couple more spots, you can treat those. We're also going to have to solve the question of how many lesions. As I said, in cranial radiation, or excuse me, cranial stereotactic radiosurgery, it was one lesion to begin with. And then clearly, you know, we had somebody on the table, they had the frame on, or you saw on the, cyber, on the MRI on the treatment planning scan, how they had a second lesion. So it was pretty easy to go from one to two. And then pretty soon it was one to two to three. And then you're up to four and five. And now with certain devices for cranial radiation, we can treat 10, 15, and 20. I don't think we'll ever get there with, for spine stereotactic. It takes a lot longer to deliver, a lot longer to set the patient up. But eventually you could see this evolving to saying we could treat more than just three. What are the dose parameters? What's the normal tissue tolerance? What can the cord tolerate? We have to worry about structures around uh, the spinal column as well in terms of kidneys, lung, trachea, esophagus. All of those are going to receive some limited amount of radiation. As we start to escalate the radiation dose, is the bone going to heal as well? Do we have to worry about creating maybe mechanical instability? So far that hasn't seemed to be an issue, but it's something that we need to keep in mind. What's the best way to combine it with surgery? If there's a need for mechanical stabilization, we're going to need your input in terms of how to define the target afterwards because of some of the artifact that the instrumentation may cause. And lastly, we'll hopefully uh, be able to participate in the question, which is better, body stereotactic or protons, and uh, know which one's going to work.
Thank you. So metastatic disease to the spine. Uh, disclosures, I do receive some research support from Mayo Spine, and we do receive institutional support from Cynthia Spine and have received support from, in the past from Depew Spine. So metastatic disease to the spine. So for the benefit of the residents and fellows in the rooms, you know, on our in-training test, on our board examination, you will often be quizzed on factoids regarding chordoma, osteoidosteoma, giant cell, and things that are typically or classically uh, uh, positioned in the spine in various locations. And those are fun to kind of test on, but the reality in practice is this. The overwhelming majority of tumors that we see in the spine are going to be metastatic disease. Over 95% of spine tumors will be metastatic disease. In the United States, there are roughly 1.4 million new diagnoses of cancer per year. And it's estimated that 50% of these patients will expire due to their disease. And of these, metastatic disease is present, or metastatic spine disease is present in 30 to 90% of patients, depending on which uh, uh, study you cite. And of these, 50% will need some kind of treatment and 10% will need surgery or are estimated to need surgery. And so that's a lot of people in the United States who will need surgery for metastatic disease to their spine. And as we get better in treating primary tumors, as we get better in improving life expectancy and prognosis from primary tumors, we can only expect that the prevalence of metastatic disease to increase. Now, what is the path of METS? Well, we know METS can come from anywhere. It's been, it's been associated with uh, breast cancer 16.5% of the time, lung 15.6% of the time, prostate 9.2% of the time, kidney and thyroid. Most commonly it's uh, spread hematogenously via Batson's plexus. As we all remember, Batson's plexus is that valvous plexus of veins around the spinal column. And because of its valvous nature, any kind of increase of intra-abdominal or intra-thoracic pressure can lead to a retrograde flow and increase your exposure time for, C uh, for tumor cells to seed around the spinal column. Same uh, pathway for epidural abscess. Ex tumors can also spread via contiguous spread and less commonly to the spinal cord via tumor shedding. Sites of METS, well, thoracic spine is the most common, usually 70% of the time, lumbar spine 20% of the time, and, but we know that metastatic disease can occur in the cervical spine and in the sacrum as well. Now, for clinical presentation, the most common complaint is just back pain. 85% of patients with metastatic spine disease will present with back pain. It's a pretty nonspecific clinical complaint. I think most of us here in the room see a lot of patients with back pain, and the large majority of these patients do not have metastatic spine disease. But if someone has a history of a prior malignancy, it should raise our index of suspicion for the possibility of metastatic spine disease, and our, and our threshold for ordering advanced imaging should be a little bit lower. In addition, the quality of this kind of back pain is a little bit different. Uh, typically, this pain is progressive and unrelenting. It's typically not relieved at rest, and night pain is a common feature associated with pain uh, from a neoplasm. What is the source of pain? Well, this might just be more of an academic discussion than anything else. There are a lot of uh, hypotheses on why we get pain from metastatic spine disease, but most likely it's either due to some level of fracture, whether it's a microfracture or larger fracture, a neurocompressive pathology, or spinal instability. Now, after a full clinical workup with the history and physical, we go to our imaging, and usually we start off with x-rays for our, our first screening test. X-rays have been estimated to be abnormal in 80 to 90 percent of spine tumors. I'm not sure if I necessarily believe that because if you think about it, you need about a 30 to 50 percent bone loss in an area of the spinal column to be abnormal on an X-ray. This is an AP and lateral of a lumbar spine of a patient of mine with metastatic renal cell carcinoma. And at first glance, we, we might say that there's really not that much there. If you look at the AP, we, the patient has a apparently a mild degenerative scoliosis, but if you look more closely, this patient is really missing that left L3 pedicle, that typical classic winking owl or winking pedicle sign, whereas if you look at all the other levels, the pedicles are readily appreciable. If you look in the lateral, we don't see any fracture or gross fracture or spondylolisthesis. If you look at the L3 level, it looks like there might be some osteolysis here, but then if you step back and look at the greater picture, there's a lot of soft tissue overlay, so it's, this, this kind of x-ray may be hard to interpret. So that's why we get advanced imaging. And for this patient, a CT is ordered, and you can see he has a significant amount of osteolysis in that L3 level. The CT, as we all know, is good for bony anatomy. It, it helps us evaluate bone destruction, the extent of the osteolysis. It helps us determine spinal stability. And, and very importantly, it also helps us with preoperative planning for instrumentation placement. An MRI is also necessary in, in the workup of these patients, um, if possible, as we need to get an idea of the, the neural structures, how much canal compromise there is, how much invagination into, into the canal there is, what is the soft tissue component of this tumor that's not uh, seen with an x-ray or CT scan, and also to evaluate other lesions and uh, potential skip lesions. Oftentimes, we as a surgeon may be the first person to diagnose this patient with cancer, and we have to uh, diagnose, or well, we have to come up with the uh, primary. This patient may come with metastatic back pain, and uh, with an unknown primary, and this patient really needs a workup to figure out what that primary uh, tumor is. So a full scan is really done, and this is, can, can be done either by the surgeon, the primary care physician, or the oncologist. 
Typically, this entails a CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, and what we're looking for is a primary focus of that tumor, anything that'll help us determine what kind of a tumor this is. Checks, chest x-ray, skeletal surveys are also uh, helpful in determining uh, uh, what the primary tumor is. Bone scan helps us look for other sites of skeletal metastasis. And laboratory examination or laboratory markers uh, in a targeted fashion can be useful as well. This patient of mine who presented to my clinic with two-week history of back pain. And normally, two-week history of back pain is pretty unremarkable, but he's in a lot of pain. You can see that from the AP, this is, an, this is not an upright x-ray. This is a cross-table lateral because he really has trouble tolerating the upright position. Just couldn't sit up, just couldn't, couldn't stand up. And during the entire visit, he's lying supine on the examining table. Got some x-rays here. And you can see on the, on the lateral here, he's got significant amount of osteolysis or some sort of signal disturbance here at L5. There's no fracture that we can see. There are no spondylolisthesis or, or collapse. And the AP looks relatively benign. But just based on this patient's history and, his, and the quality of this pain that he's describing and clinical assessment, uh, I, far, I didn't do my typical back pain treatment um, with someone who comes in with two weeks of back pain. And I, I got an MRI on this patient right away. You can see he has a large lesion here at the L5 level. Uh, for the benefit of the residents and fellows in the audience, uh, this is a, anytime you see a lesion in the spine, you know, infection is always part of the differential. This has some of the classic MRI features of a spinal tumor. As you can see, that the disc spaces are relatively preserved uh, because of its avascular nature, whereas with infection, the disc spaces are, are commonly not preserved. CT scan was done in this patient, and you can see a significant amount of osteolysis at that L5 level. So this patient was admitted to the hospital. A full workup was done. Um, he was found to have widely metastatic pancreatic cancer. Why is it so important for us to know what that primary tumor is? Well, patients will often ask me, why don't you just take, take it out and then figure out what it is after the fact? And that's not really advisable because if we need to know what this tumor is to help us, A, counsel the patient regarding prognosis, and B, more importantly, to figure out what the appropriate treatment is. This is an older slide, but you can see that with different kinds of diagnoses, different kinds of histology, this helps determine prognosis. And you can see someone with pulmonary or gastric metastatic cancer really has much poorer prognosis than someone with breast or prostate cancer. In addition, if this ends up being myeloma, well, this patient, or not this patient in particular, but if someone has a myeloma metastatic lesion, that patient may not necessarily need surgery. That patient may just get away with that radiation. And furthermore, if this ends up being a renal cell carcinoma, and if you're planning surgery, you may want to consider preoperative embolization to uh, decrease the amount of bleeding that we see intra-op. So it's essential that we have a diagnosis um, before we initiate treatment. So what are some treatment options? Well, bracing is an option, uh, radiation, chemotherapy, and surgery. And whatever treatment option is pursued, I think the most important aspect of spine tumor care is that this is really a multidisciplinary approach. Whenever we see these patients in our office, we're usually in contact with the oncologist, the primary care physician, the pain specialist, and the radiation oncologist. It's a multidisciplinary approach to make sure we're all on the same page, we're all communicating effectively to the patient, communicating the same information, and most importantly, that we all agree on the most appropriate treatment. Uh, these patients can be tough patients to, to work with in the clinic. I usually have a long, extensive discussion and counsel them for more than an hour regarding uh, issues um, regarding their care. I'm usually the first person to tell them about their life expectancy. One of the first things I do is ask the oncologist, what is their life expectancy? What is their pr prognosis here? Because clearly that has an effect on how we're going to counsel that patient. And oftentimes the oncologist may not necessarily give that estimate to the patient because, as we all know, it's not a it's not a great estimate. We, we can be off. We can overestimate or underestimate. But when considering surgery, we, will, we really need to have some sort of number to hang our hat on. And finally, the patient has to have an understanding that this treatment for metastatic spine disease is largely palliative and is most certainly not curative. And at some point, we have to make a decision on what the best option is. And if someone who's got widely metastatic disease is the best option, an extensive reconstructive surgery with substantial blood loss or is the best option to let nature take its course. A lot of uh, factors going to make this decision. The patient of mine who had widely metastatic malignant fibrous histiocytoma, and, start, and he started to have neurological compromise. We took him to the OR and did this long fusion. You can't even see the entire fusion. It doesn't fit on the slide. And with a two-level costly transrosectomy and corpectomy and a expandable cage placement. And he ended up uh, uh, not leaving the hospital. He ended up uh, just dying from his disease. And you have to go back in retrospect and wonder, well, should things have been done, done differently? Should we have counseled the patient differently? Was surgery really the best option? And these are things that we're trying to answer right now that we don't have the answers to. And not to sound insensitive or callous, but what is the cost to society? It has been suggested that 90% of healthcare dollars are spent in the last six months of life. And when we think about a patient with a metastatic spine disease, well, that patient is not going to be irrelevant to this discussion. As we talk about health care reform, Medicare reform, these issues are going to arise. And at some point, policies and, and uh, decisions and guidelines will be put out there to help us uh, with our decision making. So 
in the course of our treatment, we have to balance this against quality of life. Metrics like quality adjusted life years and the cost of quality adjusted life years will have to come into play. At some point, this is going to uh, be, uh, be relevant. This is the focus of one of the uh, spine study groups, the AOS spine group uh, for metastatic epidural spinal cord compression, is actively studying this and looking to see what is cost effective, wh what kind of uh, guidelines and recommendations can be made for someone who's got metastatic disease, the extent of their metastasis, what kind of predictive risk factors can be uh, used to guide uh, clinicians in uh, treating their patients. In summary, metastatic spine disease is fairly common. It can be present anywhere between 30 to 90 percent of patients with uh, cancer. Prevalence is likely to increase as we improve our ability to treat primary tumors. And with any spine case, we're always looking for the preservation of neurological function and the maintenance of st stability. Uh, with the treatment of metastatic spine disease, this really has to be tempered against quality of life and survival. And most, impo most importantly, a multidisciplinary approach is really necessary for these patients to give them the optimal care that they need. Thank you. Next speaker will be uh, Fangi Zhang talking about a uh, little review on primary tumors. Thanks, Mike. Okay, so this one um, is a 49 years old female who had a history of six months back pain and also progressively kind of losing the balance and uh, three weeks of progressive weakness of the lower extremity. Um, when the patient was transferred here on the exam, is the, uh, he has a weakness on the only one uh, left leg. Um, motor score is about a 91 and decreased proprioception at the both lower extremity and the hyperreflexia. So the, they did the chest abdomen, um, pelvic CT did not see any other lesions. They only have this isolated, the T7 posterior elements lesion that's found on the MRI scan, um, the, which is a, a low intensity and T1 and T2, but you know, it's a kind of enhancing uh, very much on the, um, the, with GAD. And then we get a CAT scan as well. It shows that this has a kind of a calcified uh, lesion uh, into the canal and pushing on the spinal cord. So, um, sorry, we don't have the audience response. Um, so we just, I just uh, keep going with this one. The, uh, we did the posterior laminectomy, uh, take the patient kind of relatively urgently to the OR and decompress it and the, um, the resect the tumor from the back, uh, kind of like uh, going uh, is through the pedicle to reach the, um, the healthy bony tissue. The final pathology is a clear cell chondrosarc. Um, the, uh, we, we instrumented two above, two below, and then the uh, patient get the radiation with the 6,000 uh, gray and to the T-spine, um, the, which end in the six months of surgery. Right now, patient is due for the six months MRI scan. Um, at this time, we don't have the follow-up MRI yet. Patient clinically is doing well, though. This next case is a 16-year-old male uh, who has a one-month history of back pain. He had a prior history of a nephrectomy for renal cell carcinoma. Um, no motor deficits, but there's been some recent urinary retention. He's not, the history in that is kind of fuzzy. He thinks it might be related to some of the narcotics he just started. Um, his past medical history, some high cholesterol, peripheral vascular disease. Uh, medications are, as you can see there. Um, we'll go to imaging here. You can see that on this upper thoracic level here, he's got this kind of uh, deformity here and a collapse of that vertebrae right there. On CT scan, we can better see that collapse. On an MRI, we can see there's a soft tissue component of this uh, pushing up against the spinal cord right there. Uh, with medical oncology consultation, his estimated survival is about 14 months. Um, this was felt to be an isolated renal cell metastatic uh, lesion. And in general, the prognosis for those are a little bit better than um, other metastatic disease. So for him, uh, we did a uh, costal transversectomy. This is not the greatest of pictures, but we can see here, um, we tied off the nerve root here. This is a caudal, this is cephalid. Essentially instrumented a three above and three below, did a costal transversectomy um, with a mesh cage placement. This is a little bit earlier in my career. I think now I'd probably just only go two above, two below, and now I tend to favor those uh, um, expandable cages. Um, but that was a treatment for his metastatic disease. Uh, the sad end to this story is that he did expire three months later um, from other causes. So. That being said, I think, uh, I think something that I've learned in the, in the course of tumor care is that the line between right and wrong really is more fuzzy. I think there's a lot more issues at play here. And uh, um, if I'd known he was going to expire in three months, would I have done such an extensive surgery? Well, possibly not. But like I said, with, with tumor care, the line between right and wrong is, is not always uh, clear cut. So, yeah. So uh, possibly posterior instrumentation alone. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I would have done that for him. He did have a neurocompressive pathology. 
Um, I probably would have done two above, two below, certainly. Um, but in this particular case, I, prob I probably would have done the same. I don't know, it's hard to say. I probably would have done the same thing. I tend to be a little more aggressive now with the uh, um, spinal cord pressure or spinal cord compression. But certain, certainly in other cases, which we'll show later on, there are areas where you may want to get away with less surgery. And uh, it's, it's not well defined in, on what should be done. Um, you know, we have the ability to do so much technology has really accelerated in the past 20 years. And 20 years ago, we were asking the question, what can we do? Now, we can do a lot to reconstruct the spine, but the question is really now more what should we do? And I think that's what I, I still uh, struggle with and pick the minds of some of our experts um, here today. Thank you.